All right, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is coming live to you from my office here at Michigan State University, and I'm Robin Osborne, and along with my colleagues, Adam Witt from Purdue and Amy Stone from Ohio State, we hope you'll find this webinar very informative. Julie Gould, our presenter, is an entomologist with the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or as they usually say that acronym, APHIS. And today she will be talking to us about biological controls, benefits, and limitations using EAB as an example. Julie received her PhD in entomology from the University of Massachusetts and studying the population dynamics of gypsy moths and their natural enemies. She then did a postdoc at the University of California, Riverside, where she worked on the very successful biological control of ash whitefly. Julie joined the USDA APHIS in 1993 and working on the biological control of the Russian wheat aphid in Michigan. Julie then moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where it's warm, where she conducted research on biological control of the silverleaf whitefly, as well as the invasive weed salt cedar. Julie has been in Maryland since Massachusetts. 2000, I'm sorry, <laughs> since 2001, and has most recently been concentrating on trying to control the emerald ash borer with natural enemies. Just wanted to let you folks know um, if you have web questions during the webinar, please feel free to write them in the chat pod. We will make a note of them, and Dr. Gould will be responding to the questions after the presentation to keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Please stay tuned to the end because we would like to get your feedback, and we'll be providing a link to the survey that we'd like you to participate in. As well, for those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is going to be necessary for us to process those. The first 10 people to participate will receive an EAB goodie bag, and even if you've received an, EA good, an EAB goodie bag in the past, we really would appreciate your feedback on this webinar as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing this week on emeraldashbor.info. You will also find the recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars there. We appreciate any feedback you want to give us and we, because we always want to know how we can make these better. So thank you for attending today, and I'm going to bring up Julie's presentation, and then we'll begin. All right, Julie, it's all you. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, the, the work I'm going to be talking about today has obviously been done by a lot of people within the USDA, um, particularly um, Leah Bauer in Michigan and Gian Duan. Um, who's in Delaware, and also um, John Lolito, who's uh, running the rearing facility for our natural enemies um, in Michigan. Um, so this is a compilation of information from all of all of those and many more people. Um, this talk I put together many years ago um, when someone asked me to look at the risks and benefits of biocontrol, because people do have questions about how effective it is and what are the risks. And so I'm going to talk about that in the um, using emerald ash borer as a case study, because that I know is what you are interested in. Um, and for those of you, a uh, few people who may not know the history, I'll go through it very fast. EAB was discovered um, in 2002 feeding on ash in southern Michigan and was identified as the emerald ash borer um, and is thought to have been introduced at least 10 years before it was discovered, uh, probably brought over in solid wood packing material. Um, the adults feed on the, e on the leaves, but it's the larvae that cause the problem. They eat on the foli phloem and cambium and outer sapwood, and um, they can produce galleries that cut off the flow of nutrients um, they girdle and kill branches, and eventually, even within four or five years, an entire trees can die. Um, and it's a real problem. Um, there's a lot of ash, especially after the elms all went away. Um, due to Dutch elm disease, a lot of people replanted ash in urban areas. Um, and in eight cities, ash was found to comp um, compromise 14% of the total leaf area, because ash is a very good street tree. 
Um, it provides shade. It adds to property value. And you can see this street. Um, this was in the winter. This is probably uh, trees that have already died. But you can see the difference. I mean, it's really a very different place when the trees are gone. Um, and these dead and dying trees are very costly to remove and dispose of and then to replace. Um, so EAB is really causing an impact in our urban and suburban landscapes and in forests as well. Ash trees provide thermal cover and protection. Uh, the bark and seeds are consumed by wildlife. Um, there are 17 species of Lepidoptera that only live on ash trees. Um, <clears throat> and forest products are important. Um, ash is used in tool handles, baseball bats, guitars, furniture, etc. Um, Native uh, Americans use the inner bark, the phloem, uh, to make baskets. Um, some other Native Americans use the bark to make baskets. And ash is very important for firewood. The nursery in industry was also impacted, especially at first, very heavily because there was a moratorium on selling ash nursery stock outside the quarantine areas. Um, and in fact, it was that's how Maryland got its infestation, was somebody broke that quarantine and moved infested nursery stock to Maryland from Michigan. So as with all insect problems, there are many ways of trying to deal with the problem. Sometimes you can use mechanical control. And that was very important very early on in the EAB um, infestation in Michigan. Um, and they basically would find EAB and put up zones around it and cut down all the ash trees, bring them to marshalling yards, and chip them. Uh, to trying to destroy the emerald ash borer larvae in them. Um, and people, we've also done trapping. Trapping in terms of EAB was mostly for um, finding out where they were. But mechanical control can be expensive. You know, it was very time consuming and labor intensive and costly to cut and chip all these trees. And when the infestation gets too large, it just becomes too expensive and unwieldy. Um, Chemical control is another um, method used against invasive insects. And it can be less expensive than mechanical control. Sometimes for some insects, they air, you know, spray the insecticides out of airplanes. Um, but it's not without its consequences. Um, you know, there's non-target mortality, contamination of groundwater, pesticide drift. Um, some insects, as, as, especially the white fly I was working on in Arizona, can develop resistance very, very quickly. Um, and it's costly if you're going to treat large areas, um, especially forests, um, like where emerald ash borer is infesting. And if people do have um, you know, very valuable street trees or trees in their yard, emamectin benzoate is very effective and, and long lasting. But it's not going to be um, a solution for um, the millions and millions of trees that are at risk from emerald ash borer. Um, cultural control is another um, method of trying to contain pests, and one that was very prevalent in emerald ash borer and still is to this day. Um, there's a regulatory component maintaining quarantine compliance. And the states and APHIS um, set up quarantines and try to keep people not to move ash material out of those quarantine areas. And outreach is also important. You know, signs such as "Don't move firewood," "Stop moving the emerald ash borer." Um, you know, they've had. I know Michigan has had um, checkpoints at the bridge going over to the Upper Peninsula where they're looking for firewood and confiscating any. <coughs> so um, these have been very important. Um, Unfortunately, though, the EAB does have the potential for spread. Um, there are strong flyers naturally. Populations can move at least um, three quarters of a kilometer in a year. And probably females can move even farther than that, individual ones. But the big problem with emerald ash borer is artificial spread, movement in firewood and logs and nursery stock. As I mentioned, Maryland, uh, that's how they got their infestation. And a lot of times um, in various states, the first infestations that will be found are at campgrounds. In New York, um, it was a KOA campground where they um, first discovered the emerald ash borer. Um, and 
the real problem is is that they we they spread, but they're very, very hard to find at low density infestations. The larvae are under the bark, the adults are innocuous, the trees don't die immediately, and if they do, sometimes the emerald ash borer will kill one tree in a, in a woodlot and leave the others alone. And so it's very, very hard to find. Even with the best efforts, it certainly has been spreading around. And even since I put this talk together, this isn't the current distribution of EAB. Since I put this talk together, EAB has also been found in Georgia and in Colorado. So it keeps being found. Um, and so it's now in 20, I think it's 22 states, and um, we just keep finding it. Um, you've got to wonder about Vermont. It's in, New York, it's in New York, and it's in New Hampshire, and in Massachusetts. You've got to wonder if it's somewhere, not somewhere in Vermont as well. Um, and it, an integrated approach to controlling the emerald ash borer has been um, proposed. Um, Deb McCullough and others out in Michigan have been looking at SLAM, which is slow ash mortality, um, by girdling trees to attract EAB, treating them with insecticides or destroying them, um, and removing ash to re reduce the phloem available as a food source. And the point of this is to slow the rate at which EAB populations have um, build and spread. But what I have been involved in, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about now, is classical biological control. Um, most exotic insects arrive without the natural enemies that help regulate their populations in their native range. And um, as we found was true for EAB, very few of the natural enemies in the introduced range attack the pest. Um, at at first, less than 1% of the EAB were attacked by native parasitoids, predators, and pathogens. That has changed somewhat. Now, sometimes when the EAB is in very high density, out, really outbreak phase, we get a wasp called a tanacolis, which is a very beautiful wasp with a red abdomen. And it will come in in fairly large numbers, um, but has not been sufficient to uh, stop the spread or the buildup of EAB. Um, Classical biocontrol is the importation of a natural enemy from a foreign country for the sustained control of a pest, which is also of foreign origin. And one of the keys is the enduring pest control. Once you release them, they reproduce on their own, they disperse without further human assistance, and they persist even when the population goes to very low density. These natural enemies are very good at finding their hosts um, because also often in their native range, they are searching for hosts at very low density because they're not outbreak pests. Like EAB is not an outbreak pest in its native range. But that's the plus and the minus. Um, the plus is you, they will persist. But if you have worries about host specificity or those kinds of things, that also can be a risk. And I'll talk about those risks and benefits in just a little bit. So when do we use classical biocontrol? Um, we use it when a species is not native, like the EAB, has been established for at least five years and is causing economic or ecological damage, and eradication and control by other means is not possible. And that certainly is the situation we find ourselves in with EAB. Um, and these are the steps that are involved. And we have gone through all of these with emerald ash borer. Um, we've been to China and to Russia and to Korea and surveyed for natural enemies. Uh, we selected agents that we thought were promising. Um, we brought them into quarantine and studied their host specificity and their biology, learned how to rear them. Um, we applied for permits um, with APHIS and, then they, the, um, and also with Can Canada and Mexico, uh, review the petitions. Um, in 1987, we received permits for field release, and we've um, transferred our technology for rearing to a mass rearing facility. We've released the insects in a lot of places, and uh, we are currently in the process of evaluating the efficacy, and we're studying impacts on known targets. So <clears throat> what are the benefits of biocontrol? Well, certainly economic. Uh, reduction in crop or forest losses, reduction in the cost of other control measures, which can be very high, um, and environmental cost, reduction in the pest damage to the natural systems, and re reduction in 
effects of pesticide contamination or tree chipping or you know um, reduction in the um, effects of other control measures. Um, classical biological control in the United States got its start in the 1800s with an insect called the cottony cushion scale. And it almost destroyed the citrus industry in California. It was a horrible, horrible pest. But um, the scientists in California brought in an insect called the Vidalia beetle, which you can see here. And this parasitoid, uh, and, and a parasitoid as well, a little wasp. And between the two, they just have um, the cottony cushion scale to this day is not a problem in California. Um, the other little wasp on the lower right is a wasp that I worked on, um, which is attacking white fly. It's a little tiny, tiny, tiny wasp about the size of the head of a pin. And this is laying its egg under a white fly. But since um, 1889, there have been over 5,000 introductions of natural enemies against arthropods throughout the world. Um, and here's a, an example of one that was an enormous success. And it's the cassava mealybug. Um, cassava is native to South America, but in Africa, it is um, very, very important. And sometimes, cassava is up to 70% of the daily energy intake of, of the people. And in 1970, somehow, the cassava mealybug was introduced into Africa and was causing up to 80% crop loss. It was very horrible. I mean, people were going hungry. And um, through the efforts of, um, I know Roy Van Dreis, who um, works at University of Massachusetts, where I got my degree, he was involved. Lots of people worldwide were involved in finding this highly specific little wasp um, that was introduced and brought the cassava mealybug under control. And it was estimated that the, cost bene the benefit cost ratio was over 500 to 1 for that project. It was hugely successful. Um, and in surveys uh, worldwide, 16% um, of biocontrol projects against arthropods have been deemed to be completely, con completely control the insects. 42 have been deemed to um, have partial control. Um, some of the projects that didn't work um, didn't do so because they were too limited in duration or resources. And by that, really, it means money. There actually are studies showing that there's a direct relationship between the amount of effort and money put into something and the likelihood of success in, in biocontrol. But um, the cost ratios of these projects range from 3 to 1 to over 100 to 1. And the nice thing is these benefits c continue to accrue over time because the insects continue to do their work. Um, a study in Australia found that the cost ratio for biocontrol was on average 10.6 to 1, and that was compared with 2.5 to 1 for pesticides. Um, so even if you include the unsuccessful projects, the overall benefits of biocontrol um, outweigh the combined cost of these unsuccessful projects. Um, so let's get back to biocontrol of EAB. Um, we looked in Mongolia, and it turns out there are no ash trees in Mongolia. Um, we think now the records really meant Inner Mongolia, which is actually part of China. Um, we also looked in Japan, but um, couldn't even hardly find emerald ash borer. Um, but we have been successful in finding emerald ash borer and its natural enemies in China, Russia, and South Korea. Um, in Shangchou in Jilin province, this um, photo shows some scientists standing by what is actually a Fraxinus pennsylvanica. They do plant our um, ash trees in China, and this is one of them. And um, this is one of the insects that was found in Shangchou. It's um, a very tiny little wasp called Oobia sigrilli. And it's about the size of a head of a pin, and the female backs up to an egg and deposits a single egg inside of the EAB. And this is a picture of the larva that develops inside the egg. Um, and this is the pupa, which has also been dissected out of the egg. And then eventually, the egg will turn black, and the adult parasitoid will chew an exit hole, emerge from the egg. And this parasitoid will go on to actually have one other generation per year. They have two generations um, in one year. Um, 
Also in Chengchun, this parasitoid was discovered. It's called Tetrasticus planiponisi. It's gregarious, which means it lays multiple eggs inside of an EAB. Um, you can see the EAB on the bottom. Although it looks like it's ropey. Well, that's just, it's packed full of these parasitoids, which when they're ready to pupate, they will burst out. Um, and the top left-hand photo shows larvae and pupae in the gallery of an EAB. Um, and this insect will have 4 to 92 progeny per EAB. And um, it has four generations a year. And um, parasitism is as high as 50%. And keep in mind, that's only in one generation. Um, and so this insect has been having quite an effect on EAB, on our native ash tree in Changshan. Um, we also uh, looked in Tianjin City, which is due east of Beijing. These are Fraxinus velutina, which is also native to the United States. This is grown in uh, the southwestern U.S. Uh, high densities of EAB at this site because the soil was incredibly salty and the trees were very, very stressed. And um, one of the parasitoids we found was Sclerodermis, which we now know as puparii. And the females have these big front legs, and they actually crawl through the tunnels and dig through the frass and go into the pupil chamber in the, in the wood. Um, and they're also gregarious, laying 15 to 20 eggs. But they, this one has some problems. Part of the one problem is, is that 70 to 80 percent of the females are wingless, so they don't fly. And percent parasitism was found to be low in Tianjin. Um, so the fourth insect that we looked at was Spathius agrilli. This is a female drilling her ovipositor through the bark. And she actually paralyzes the host. So the host never feeds again. And she lays 1 to 20 eggs on the outside of the larva. You can see that all these eggs have been laid. <clears throat> and the larvae hatch and totally consume the EAB. And then this parasitoid makes cocoons inside of um, the EAB gallery. Again, multiple generations per year. And parasitism could be quite high in some of the stands that were studied in Tianjin. So, so we found these parasitoids. And it was quite, um, quite a challenge to rear them. Um, very briefly, what we would do is um, we could get rear adults out of logs. You know, there's lots and lots of logs containing EAB in Michigan. And we would rear adults from them and feed them ash foliage that we grew in the greenhouse. And you see that they're in those jars and there's lids. Well, if you look on the inside of the lid, we actually put coffee filters in there. And those are eggs of the EAB that are on the coffee filters. That's what the little um, brown and white dots are. And we did develop an artificial diet, but unfortunately, it it's not good enough for mass rearing. It's good enough for me at my research lab, but um, it's not it's not perfect. Um, but so, but for mass rearing, John Lolito and uh, Jian Duan have come up with a method of taking those eggs that are on the filter paper and putting them on ash logs from the field. And these ash logs will actually continue to start to sprout leaves and um, so the phloem is, stays fresh, and the EAB develop net normally inside of these logs. And then these logs, and, and this is huge, because what we used to do is cut down trees, extract larvae, and reinsert them into logs. It was a huge process. And this has totally streamlined the mass rearing of EAB. Um, and then we just take the logs and give them to the larval parasitoids. So we take the eggs on the filter paper and give them to Woobius. And, um, with that, John has really upped the rearing to hundreds of thousands a year. It's really, he's done an amazing job. And um, another thing that John has innovated is the release methods. On the left, you can see what we used to do, which was aspirate adults, which was time consuming, and then take them to the field to release them. And the, the parasitoids are attracted to light, and they would just leave. They would just vanish. Um, but the methods that John has developed is uh, for eggs, you see that red cup? John calls that an oobinator. And inside of that cup are pieces of paper with parasitized EAB. Their oobias are in there. And they just crawl out naturally. Um, I actually put a little honey in there for them to eat. So it's much more natural. And then also, um, these logs that John is rearing the um, parasitoids in, he's now shipping those. And you just 
put a screw eye in the top and hang them. Um, and the parasitoids, again, they come out much more naturally. And I think it's a much more effective way of releasing these insects. So, <coughs> um, so we, we know how to rear them. Uh, let's get back a little, talk a little bit about the risks. Um, some people are concerned, um, rightly so, about the unintended consequences of classical biocontrol. Uh, one thing that's been mentioned is that they're afraid of diluting the diversity. Um, but deliberately introduced natural enemies are a very small percentage of the insect fauna um, of the lower 48 states. And when you're talking about losing 17 species of Lepidoptera simply by removing ash and, and everything else that, that lives on it, like the ash bark beetle, um, that also <laughs> dilutes biodiversity. Um, and host range, host range expansion through genetics shift um, scientists consider that very rare for these specialist natural enemies uh, because there's a lot of coevolution going on. But insects do have a natural range of insects that they will find suitable for attack. And that's the issue with emerald ash borer, and that's what we concentrated on. And that's were these insects able and willing to attack insects that were not the emerald ash borer? Um, and we conducted extensive host specificity testing. Um, this setup was uh, Leah Bauer tested um, the oobius, and what she did was take ash sticks and wrapped um, curling ribbon around it and got various insects to lay their eggs on these sticks and then presented them to oobius to see if they would lay eggs. Um, there's some of the eggs on these sticks. Um, for the larvae, what we did was we took bronze birch borer larvae, two-line chestnut borers, raspberry cane borers, whatever we could find. And we took their natural host, drilled a groove, put the uh, larva in there, and then we wrapped floral tape around it because we found that the insects would actually oviposit through this floral tape onto the insects we were testing. So in summary, we found that all three of the parasitoids that we've been releasing attack significantly more EAB than non-target insects, both in choice and no choice tests. Um, we also did some olfactometry work with Spathius agrilli, and we found that it's attracted to ash and not much else. It really, and when we are rearing it, we get much more reproduction when we're rearing it in the presence of EAB adults feeding on ash leaves. So it's really attuned to that ash habitat. Um, neither of the larval parasitoids were reared from any agrilis other than EAB in China. Our cooperators did an extensive survey and found thousands and thousands of um, agrilis larvae and never found uh, any of our EAB parasitoids. Um, and the other thing is there are Spathius and Tetrasticus native to the United States. And every once in a while, Spathius floridanus will attack EAB. But we've never found a native Tetrasticus switching over to EAB. So members of the genus tend to be pretty um, host-specific. Um, so what about EAB? What are the benefits? Um, well, again, ecosystem functions and reduced pesticide use. And safety is really important. You know, trees can lose limbs and topple once they're damaged by EAB, injuring or killing people. Um, and this, this figure is actually a couple of years old already. But as of a couple of years ago, APHIS in the States had already spent $29.5 million per year on average and $206 million total since 2003. Um, it's very expensive to, to treat or remove or replace um, all these trees. And some economists estimated that it would cost $25 billion in the 25 states they were anticipating um, being infested with emerald ash borer. And the compensatory value of these 8 billion ash trees in the forests are um, estimated by the Forest Service to be worth $282 billion. So um, ash is very um, economically important. Um, but there are other things you need to consider in the risk of VAB biocontrol. And one is efficacy. Um, are they, is parasitism high? Um, especially in the trees that we know in China are native to the United States. And percentage parasitism by three of the parasitoids, Spathius, Oobius, and Tetrasticus, were all over 
50% in China, and all three of these species are multivoltine, which means they attack more, they have several generations per year compared to the one for the EAB. But that one parasitoid that attacked the pupae, the sclerodermis, it ha the level of attack was very low. The females, many of them, do not fly. And some species in this genus are known to sting people. <laughs> And so it was absolutely never worth bringing that species into this country for testing because the risks, the benefits of this, with this species were absolutely not worth the risks. Um, so we never did anything with it. Um, and for the non-target effects, low levels of attack on native agrilis, EAB is preferred and no risk of the insects attacking humans or invading their houses like the multicolored lady beetles do. Um, so then, really, when we applied for a petition for release, we were really doing a risk analysis, which is taking these scientific data um, and assigning values to risks and benefits. And for Emerald Ash Borer, it was determined that the benefits outweighed the risks, and release permits were granted in 2007. Um, some very small numbers were released, just what Leah Bauer and I could rear in our labs. Um, but in 2009, the EAB biocontrol facility became operational. Um, and what they did was in 2009, they reared a, a lot of Spathius. The next year, they brought Tetrasticus online. And then in 2011, Olobius. But as of um, this year, they've released over 1.2 million parasitoids, which is considering that you're rearing these things on an insect that feeds under the bark of trees is really phenomenal. Um, and the parasitoids have now been released in 16 of the, I think it's now 23 infested states. Um, so the parasitoids have been released um, widely. Um, this shows um, where the parasitoids have been released. The yellow, I think, shows the infested counties. Um, and the green shows the count where, where we've been releasing uh, the parasitoids. Um, and as you can see, I mean, you know, we've been going up from Minnesota all the way through New York, south through Tennessee. So we're really getting the parasitoids spread around. Um, and we're also recovering them and establishing the parasitoids. Um, we go back and we use various methods to try to find uh, the parasitoids. We put out yellow pan traps. We peel trees. We look for eggs, which is a very tedious process. But we are recovering them. And studies in Michigan where um, we've been releasing the parasitoids the longest are showing that their populations are really building up. Um, the top left graph shows um, the percentage of trees that have at least one larva attacked by Tetrasticus. And one year after parasitoid release, we were already seeing 35% of the trees had Tetrasticus in it. And you'll notice the gray bars are the control plots. These are at least a kilometer away. And even within one year, Tetrasticus had spread to the control plots. And if you look at the bottom right-hand graph, um, that's percent parasi percentage parasitism. And it's four years after release, it's already up to 20%. And that's given, you know, the EAB had a huge head start um, at many of these sites. So the the Tetrasticus is really building up. In fact, um, John Lolito at the rearing facility will go out, collect trees, um, give the, put them in his Spathius colony, and out will come Tetrasticus. So they're getting around to places where we're not even releasing them. They're really, really on the move. Um, Aerobius has also been building in numbers, but I don't it doesn't seem to move as fast. It took several years before even small numbers were found at the control site. And that makes sense. It's really, really tiny. It's not a strong flyer. And it probably um, gets moved around mostly by the wind. Um, but it, too, is um, even three years after release, is up to 20% parasitism. Now, you'll notice that I haven't been talking about Spathius. I have no slide for how well Spathius is doing in Michigan because something very strange has happened. Spathius really establishes well. We get you know, upwards of 45% parasitism the year after release. It seems to overwinter. It survives. We peel trees in the spring. There it is in large numbers. And then we go back. 
and it's gone. And we really don't know why. <laughs> um, I'm guessing there's some sort of um, synchrony issue between the availability of the stages it needs, which is the large larvae, and when it comes out um, and emerges in the spring. But, um, but we need something like Aspatheus, because Tetrasticus planipanesi has a very short ovipositor. It cannot attack EAB through thick bark. I mean, any, any tree that's over about 11 centimeters, the bark is too thick for Tetrasticus to attack the EAB. However, we have found um, another Spathius species from Russia, which has a very long ovipositor. It's found from further north, um, where the climate is different, um, very much n further north than Spathius agrilli. And um, the host specificity testing has been completed. Um, the only thing it attacked was the gold-spotted oak borer, which is a pest out in California. It did not attack anything else. And we have um, completed a release petition and submitted that. Um, for Spathius agrilli, we have not totally ceased rearing it. We are still rearing it because we have not studied how it, um, how it works in the more southern states like Kentucky or Tennessee. Um, in states like that where it's warmer, the synchrony may be different and it may do just fine. So we are continuing to rear and release Spathius agrilli in the south. and We're hoping to bring uh, Spathius galini on board, um, hopefully next year in the north. Um, but we're still waiting for word on our petition. So um, I believe that is all I have. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Julie. This has uh, been very informative as far as uh, kind of, you know, answering a lot of questions that I receive from people over the website who are saying, well, you know, is it, has it, has it gotten rid, have the uh, biocontrol, has it gotten rid of the EAB in these areas and, and that kind of thing. So I, I think people have uh, a very, um, you know, you no, know, I guess it's, they're a hopeful view that, you know, once the, uh, little invaders come out, they're going to just, you know, decimate EAB and everything's going to be good. <laughs> well, I will, I can, I can tell you from experience that that's simply, unfortunately, not going to happen. We, you know, all of the sites where we've been releasing the parasitoids, honestly, the big trees have died. We can't get enough of these insects reared and in there to to save the big trees. And um, what we're hoping is, and what we're currently studying is as these parasitoids are building up in really good numbers, what's happening to the understory, you know, for the future of the ash at those sites. I mean, ash can grow pretty fast. I've heard that in Ann Arbor, which was hit really early, there are some big ash trees that have grown from the stump sprouts. Um, and so, we are now studying what are the Oobius and Tetrastic is doing on this next generation of ash because we have um, emerald ash, by the time we find emerald ash borer, it's usually there in pretty big numbers, and it's so no, I, I'm afraid the big trees probably won't make it even with the natural enemy. It is very sad. And that's what we're finding. It looks like John's got a question. How does APHIS decide where to strategically or programmatically release the reared parasitoids? Um, so far, we fortunately have not had to make those decisions. We have so far, John Lolito has kept up pretty much with, um, with, with the requests as they have come in. But John's very correct. Um, you know, there will come a day when there will be more requests than there are um, than there are parasitoids to send out. And um, I know that John Lolito, I think, makes the decisions, but we do have a um, an, kind of a cross-functional working group that discusses, you know, the the various requests, and and it's based on. Um, many things like the suitability of the site, um, where where parasitoids have been released before, uh, you know, making sure, trying to get them all over. In terms of Spathius agrilli, the 
strategic, the program decided not to release it below, above the 40th parallel. So, um, so lots and lots of factors go into it, but I think ultimately John Lolito makes the decisions as to where to send his parasitoids, and it's, and part of it too is just availability. You know, if if John is in, if it's in the spring and John has. 10,000 tetrasticus ready to go, and it's only warm enough in, t in Tennessee, the, the parasitoids will go to Tennessee. So it's really, I th as the season progresses, it's kind of a moving target as to who needs them, who, wh where the day degrees line up for releases to be made, and who's put in requests, and who has appropriate sites. OK. Um, in, in light of that, let's say you now Colorado is the latest state to have uh, found emerald ash borer, does, um, if they were to put in a request, then approximately, I mean, does it take, then Then that means that that John and his crew would look at this site and say, okay, yes, we could do it next spring or whatever. They're the ones that kind of make the determination on how quickly something like a, you know, a, a release of the parasitoids would be going there? Well, Colorado would have to apply for a permit first. They don't have a permit, <laughs> so <laughs> that would that would be step number one. Okay. So, um, um, I actually New England. I encouraged all the New England states to go ahead and get permits, and they did. And they actually had them in place when the pairs, when EAB was found, and they actually were releasing the very same year, like in Massachusetts and Connecticut. The they were ready to go. But Colorado, to, to my knowledge, does not have a permit. They probably weren't expecting to find it this soon. Yeah, that that was kind of out of the blue. <laughs> so, looks like we have uh, yeah. another question. It says, is APHIS looking into rearing or augmentatively releasing native parasitoids like Atanacolis or, OK, Phasgonophora? Phas <laughs> um, the, an the answer is no. Um, Atanacolis um, is a seems to be only coming in when densities of EAB are very, very high. I mean, the, the trees are almost dead, lots of EAB, and then we see a tanacolis. So it's not, what we need is something that's going to be effective at the lower densities. Um, and phasgonophora is fairly sporadic. We don't ever see very, very high percentages of that, although I think in Canada they may have some, some uh, cases where they did, but the answer is no. Uh, APHIS has its hands full with the parasitoids that they have. Okay, um, Julie. In in past releases of of um, biological control for different pests, is there have you seen is there like a timeline where you know can say well in ten years it may or may not be under control or we see significant results in lowering populations of pests in X number of years? Or is there that kind of information? Probably not. It has to be, you know, particular to each pest that, that the biological control agents are released upon. Yeah, it, it, it really does depend on the pest. And, um, you know, for instance, the ash white fly that I worked on in, in California Literally within a year, I released parasitoids at my release plots, and I had control plots that were up to 11 kilometers away. And because the pest was multi, the pest had several generations a year. The parasitoid had many generations a year. And by the time the year was up, in in the year in Southern California, you now the season's pretty long. The the parasitoids had moved into the white fly population and literally decimated them in a year. <laughs> and so it was very, very fast. But then you take um, the very successful biocontrol of uh, winter moth in Nova Scotia. Um, Doug Embray released the parasitoids. He got the parasitoids. Um, it was a fly that lays its eggs on the foliage, and the winter moth eats this egg, and it hatches. It was five years before he even recovered a single parasitoid. He didn't even see them for five years, and yet eventually they built up and they have successfully controlled the uh, winter moth for 50 years up in Nova Scotia. So it literally all depends. <laughs> and and 
um, you know, we're we're hopeful that <laughs> this will this will go and have the same happy outcome as the winter moth. Well, that, that's good information for folks like me who who get a lot of um, requests for um, information about what's going on with this. Um, and of course, I am mainly just the communications person. I am not the scientist. So this is this has been really helpful for me as far as at least knowing what kind of, uh, you know, answers people might be looking for. And um, also, you, you know, you and Leah Bauer are good sources to send uh, some of these folks to it as far as information and that kind of thing. So they really appreciate it. Um, sure. Are there any other questions? Assuming I'm, assuming I'm never allowed back at work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you were able to uh, you meet with us uh, despite the despite the the furlough and uh, you know help us out here. So, are there other questions from anybody else in the audience? Um, I'm gonna uh, entertain them for about three four more minutes, um, and if anyone else has information. Uh, that they'd like to to get from Julie or to part you know to ask her about or to talk to her about um, that would be that would be great so we can get this done also I want to remind you this is being recorded um, so if if you know of folks that missed it or have uh, had were not able to join please uh, make sure you visit emerald info and we will have the recorded webinar posted there this week.